A um, couple of things related to research and theory. Um, I introduced you to Baltz, Paul Baltz. He's passed away now, but he was a heavy hitter in terms of uh, theory related to development, among many others. <coughs> Erickson, Piaget, Vygotsky, Ron von Brunner, the list is long and distinguished. But I want to talk to you about how in the world people come about um, developing a theory. Where do theories come from? They don't fall out of the sky. There's a rhyme or reason for this stuff. And um, I want to talk briefly about that with you for a few minutes, and then we'll move into other things in our next lecture. So let's begin with this. What is a theory? Basically, by definition, it's a set of logically related concepts that seeks to organize, explain, and predict data. Now, data, data, whatever you want to call it, it's fine. We're in the South, call it data. So logically related concepts logic, thinking, rationally, uh, uh, reasoning, all of these things that, that have to do with logical thinking, making sense. Can I come up with some goofy, weird idea and develop a theory from it? Absolutely. But you better be able to prove it. So we have a theory. Once we arrive at a theory, that's it's sound, but it can be I was going to say attacked, but I, that's maybe too strong a word. Be, it can be examined strongly because that's what you're supposed to do as a researcher. Now, how do we get there? Well, we start out with an idea. The idea becomes an hypothesis. Yeah, we're in college, so we say an, A-N, hypothesis, not a hypothesis. So it becomes an hypothesis. Uh, what is a hypothesis? Possible explanations for phenomena. And we use those to predict the outcome of, of whatever the experiment is. So there's there are things that we look at. And um, we say, hmm, I bet if we do this, potentially that will happen. There's no absolute there. That's where the experimentation comes in. So you go through the experiment process through replication. There's a difference between duplication and replication. Duplication is doing the same thing with the same material over and over again. It tells you nothing. After you duplicate it one time, hey, it's okay, whoopie doo. What you want to do is replicate it. So I want to say, for instance, uh, use you, this class, as my experimental group. And I'm going to uh, plug in what it is I'm looking at, and then I get the results. I may want to duplicate that just to make sure that I did it right. But once that duplication is completed, now I want to change something. And I'm going to change one of the factors. Uh, the easiest thing to do is to change the sample. So what I'm going to do is um, replace this class with another class. So I'm going to do this with you in my developmental class, whatever this is. And then I'm going to take this same set of factors and I'm going to go over to my cross-cultural class or one of my graduate classes that I teach. And I'm going to say, here it is. And then I'm going to get back results from that. And when I do, then I've replicated. And I want to replicate and replicate and replicate until we say we've gotten the data saturated. So we're not getting any new stuff. Nothing's changing and voila. Now we can say somewhat that we have a theory. There's still a lot more that you have to do to prove that because you it's got to be peer reviewed and it's going to get ripped to pieces. And you got to name off some things, the limitations and so on and so forth. Stuff that you haven't heard of potentially. Maybe you have if you've had a lot of science courses. Now, what's the big deal with that? Well, to reach these theories, this research is done. The experiments are done. And I'm applying this to developmental psychology for you because that's what the class is. So I want to talk to you quickly about some theories um, that came about from two viewpoints. So these people went through the scientific process 
And in that process, they came up with these uh, theories. And they're very, very different, but they address developmental, the developmental process, the lifespan process in a human being. And let's start with John, uh, John Locke. The question that's, that's being answered, attempted to be, in, uh, to be answered, is, is development active or is development reactive and the and these two theories address that so john locke states that a young mind is a blank state uh, <laughs> yeah a blank slate nothing up there uh so all learning that takes place is done by nurture what is nurture that's outside that's not biology that's outside influences. If you can hear my phone in the background, I apologize. One of my sons is texting me and I forgot to mute my phone. So learning is nurture. Nature is biology. Nurture is learned. Nature is unlearned. So John Locke is taking the nurture standpoint. Everything that's up here, you were born with it. It was taught to you. On the other hand, Jean Jacques, Rousseau, see, I can speak a little French. I see it. Done for the day. He says that young minds are inherently good, but are corrupted by society. Ooh. So he's taking a nurture standpoint as well. Uh, the kick against these is that both views are very simplistic and they don't account for internal motivations. Who am I and what motivates me? And Although these things may be true, they uh, they don't take into consideration these internal things. And the critics say that those internal motivations direct and influence your development. This is kind of a Vygotsky view. Children can't develop properly in isolation. Vygotsky says they can learn, but they learn quicker if you teach them. So I give you a ball, here's a ball, and you sit in the floor and you look at it, and all you know is you got this thing in your hand, you don't know anything about it, and you drop it and it rolls away. Well, either you're gonna cry or you're gonna go after it or whatever your reaction is. If I show you things to do with the ball, you learn what a ball can do. With that, you'll eventually learn, but you learn much quicker if somebody helps you, that's called scaffolding. And that's Vygotsky's thing. So he looks at Locke and Rousseau a little bit differently. The Locke model, if you want to call it that, is a mechanistic model. He says people equate to machines. They react to environmental input and their responses are predictable. So whatever the stimuli is, we can apply that culturally, cross-culturally, any way we want to apply it, because if we present some sort of a stimuli, you are going to react a certain way based on what we think the research tells us. People um, identify factors, or rather the theory identifies factors that make people behave as they do. Uh, some of the things that are looked at are advertising and, and think about these advertising stress peer influence your own interests the list is a very long list that's the mechanistic model what about the non-mechanistic model what do we call that well that's Locke says mechanistic Rousseau says organistic so organistic means that we are active organisms and as a human, we set development in motion. Change is internal, not external. So it's here and it, it affects everything else. The environment uh, can affect development, but it doesn't cause it. Now you get a lot of arguments out of people who espouse to, the, uh, to people like um, Darwin, who say, and, and, and uh, William James, and maybe or maybe, I know you probably know who Darwin is, maybe you don't unless you remember your intro to psych class, William James, he was a proponent of Darwin, uh, Darwin's theory, theory of 
uh, survival of the fittest, the evolution. And he said that uh, people adapt and that's how they develop. So uh, Rousseau is saying the situations or the circumstances or the activities that you choose to participate in and with whom you choose to participate in those things with is going to affect your development. So it's it's internal, not external. Now I'm going to stop there because I'm going to pick up in our next lecture and I'm going to talk about some um, different views of this and I'll give you a little hint. It's called continuous and discontinuous and I'll explain that in our next lecture. So I hope this one uh, kind of cleared the air for you in terms of uh, just how in-depth this thing can get and uh, I'll be talking to you soon.